Welcome to Campbellsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the Discipleship Pastor. It's my honor and privilege to be with you today as we continue to dive into God's Word and study the life of Elijah. Uh, we've looked at Elijah over the last couple sessions, and we're going to continue to look at his life for the next coming uh, times together. And so I hope that you have your Bible and want to grab it. Go ahead and get it. Uh, you can open it up to uh, 1 Kings. Uh, we'll be in that book today. We may jump around a little bit, but that's our main passage of Scripture that we will be in. 1 Kings, I'll tell you the chapter in just a moment. But um, hope that you uh, enjoy uh, these times together. And they're challenging and they're inspiring and they're informative and that you learn more about who God is during these times. Let's pray and we'll get started. God, we thank you for today, for the opportunity we have to gather, to, to, to join our hearts together uh, with yours as we go through your scripture, your love letter to us, your inspiration, your guide, your playbook, whatever we need, you have it in there for us. And so God, may we become more like you because we've encountered you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have looked at the way God protected Elijah by placing him in the wilderness to drink from a stream and have ravens feed him. Remember, he had confronted the king about turning their backs on God and putting up these um, idolic posts and poles, asterisk, worshiping Baal, those kind of things. And, and so he confronted the king. Then he had to fear for his life. So he ran and he went to um, to the, the ravines and the wilderness and the mountains to get away. And he was being fed. God said, I'll put you there. I will take care of you. I'll provide you water from the streams and, I will, and the ravens will bring you food twice a day. And so that's what's been going on. And Elijah's having to totally depend upon God for everything in his life. And so we're going to pick up at that point and look at other ways that God protected him and that God will protect us. And so um, just a little bit of background before we get started. Elijah is going to move from the mountainous region to, to a town called Zarephath. Fath. I can't pronounce it right. but um, And there's a lady there and a son who are facing starvation and famine because there has been no rain in the land for an extended period of time. Remember, Elijah said no rain for three years. Um, and so this is during that time period where there's famine and there's dry ground and the ground is cracked and parched and dusty and nasty and dirty. And we don't know much of this except we don't know much about what starvation is really like here in America. We have people who are hungry and who don't get enough food, but we don't understand true starvation except for what we see on TV. Now, some may, but most people that I know don't understand true starvation or desolation and even isolation. However, what we see on TV is real in different parts of the world and how destitute people are in those parts of the world. But we, we tend to only get the emotional pull uh, when we see it on TV and all the pleas are made. And, um, and we send food. We send food around the world uh, for people. So I want you to think about for a moment as we get started, what was your most vivid memory of helping someone in need? Have you ever seen someone in need? Have you ever experienced someone in need that you went out of your way to help? As you were growing up, depending on what generation you are, maybe the way that you see need around you and, and people who need help. Um, and think about a moment, a time when someone actually helped you when you were in a time of need. Here's what we know. We know this, and we know this about Scripture. God cares for His children. And sometimes we have to wait until the last minute to experience His faithfulness. And this is the story of Elijah. And so open your Bibles to 1 Kings. I think I said 2 Kings only, but 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to start in verse 6, 7. And following, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Remember, Elijah's out in the mountainous wilderness region uh, hiding. And so this is where the waters were running off flash floods and running down the mountain, much like runoff. Um, and so 
There had been no rain in the land. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, 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 and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. And she replied, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour and a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm actually gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of, the, of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day Lord sends rain, the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So the lady went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah, the woman, and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So let's, let's pick it apart just for a moment and examine this. You gotta, Elijah had to travel about 100 miles as the raven flies through the desert and, terrain, and rough terrain to reach this new location. So he had traveled from the mountainous, rugged, uh, jagged rock, uh, parched land region to this place. Because his water source had dried up with no rains, so then there's no runoff. So the streams will dry, off, dry up if they're not well fed or spring fed. And these were not. These were runoff. Um, you understand that he was being hunted by nations. A bounty was placed on his head. So he, he had to move in stealth-like mode. Zarephath was only eight miles from the home of Jezebel, the, the, the queen the one who was really after uh, Elijah, just eight miles, not very far. If you live in Campbellsville, it's about the distance from here to Greensburg. Not very far at all. The widow recognized Elijah by his clothes or something or his accent as an Israelite. Remember, she said, she said, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. In other words, she knew who he was or at least where he was from. Elijah was giving her more than food. He was sharing relationship with God of with the God of Israel with a non-Israelite. This happened another time in the Bible where uh, a chosen widow did something in Luke chapter four, verses twenty-four through twenty-six. It says, "Truly I tell you," he continues, "no prophet is, is accepted in his hometown." I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Sidon. The hardest place for a famous person to gain respect is at home. You know why? People know you too well. To go home means you have to go back to all the experiences you had as a kid, to, to the way you were perceived by your classmates and by the town and by the people and the way your family's perceived. Or, because if I go back, when I go back home, I wonder, you know, do they remember all the, the really stupid stuff I did? And are they still holding me accountable and judging me by some of the behaviors I had as an adolescent? Um, someone who, who at times would rebel or against my parents or against God or wherever. You know, we all have those moments. It's really hard to go back. Oh, that's just Brad. Or the respect is not there, maybe. There was another poor widow in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury temple. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And then Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor woman has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth or out of their abundance. But she gave out of her 
poverty. She put in all that she had to live on. You see this, Jesus was standing more than likely at the court of the women, which was the first court that Jews could enter. There was a Gentile court where only outsiders, non-Jewish people could enter that far into the temple. Then the next one was the court of the women, which was the first of the inner courts. And the, the court of the women was the furthest any female or woman could go into the temple or into the inner court system. The altar consisted of 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles used to collect donations or offerings. And her coin <coughs> was the smallest coin used. It was made of copper and worth about one-eighth of, one of our pennies. But it's all she had. It's all she had. Others were giving out of excess. She was giving out of destitute. You know, there's a lot of things in this brief passage of Scripture that we read out from Elijah that we could go back and look at. There was no rain, so God's promise and His, His, His commitment was staying true. Elijah had to deal with famine. His water source dried up, which also meant the ravens, his food source, stopped coming because they would come and bring him bread, but they would also drink from the stream. So now there's no reason for them to come. And so now he was without water, without food. Therefore, he had to move, and God directed him to a place, to, to a lady who was at her wit's end. She was really, actually, at that moment when she, they encountered one another, she was preparing to die. So many times we have God moments or God appointments that we don't understand. Elijah, had a, he was a prophet. He had a different type of understanding. But we don't know how people, where people are in their lives at the moment that we encounter them. God puts people in our paths and in our, in our lives for us to have a kingdom impact. And that's what Elijah did. He had a kingdom impact. Not only did he, by him coming, she was able to have life sustained physically, but she was also introduced to God, the God of Israel, not some Baal-type God. And so he only met, not only ministered physically with food, spiritually, but more than likely emotionally as well because now she had someone who she saw as someone who could help Help her emotionally. Um, and the faith that it took every morning to go to that jar and to pour out a little oil and find that there's oil and to go just enough and then get some flour every day and find that there's flour still in that jar and in every day. And that that promise went on. For the, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word the Lord spoken by Elijah. So let's talk about a, a few things that we, we can learn from this. You know, Elijah had been fed by the ravens for about a year, but he needed more assurance God was in control. Because now he looked around and it was all dried up. The ravens gave him enough food twice a day. The flour and oil from the lady or just enough daily. What good would it have done to have a barrel of flour and a keg of oil? There'd be no faith. There would be no dependence. Look, I got plenty. And sometimes we get to that point in our lives where we, where we think we've got enough. We've got more than enough. We, so therefore we rely on ourselves and our own abilities and we ignore God in the process. Elijah, like us, needed to learn to trust God completely and consistently. Did you hear that? Consistently. A lot of times we may um, trust God in those certain moments of our lives, but not on a day-to-day -day basis. When things are really, really bad, we turn to God and say, please, God, help. But we don't realize that God is helping even in the good times. So one thing, principle number one from this short um, passage of Scripture, God is concerned about all people. It doesn't matter where you're from, 
who you know, what you have, what you don't have, color, race, social economic status, it doesn't matter. God loves everyone. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Didn't say the United States, didn't say Israel, didn't say Africa, didn't say South America. It said, for God so loved the world, the world in its entirety, which means all of her people. God wants to have a relationship with everyone. We choose whether or not we do, but God wants and desires so deep within him. God loves the world. Second principle. God honors those who put others first. You see, the lady, this woman, when Elijah said, hey, bring me some water and some bread, and she explained it all, she went and made him the bread first. She put the other's needs in front of her own son and herself. She could have said, nope, I'm going to do what I said. I don't have enough for you, but instead she sacrificed. She took a leap of faith, if you want to say that. Because, see, her son and her son, they were starving to death. They were going to die in the next day or so because all they had was enough for just a little bit of bread. But then she received a word from God through Elijah. How often does God use people to speak truth into our lives? And not necessarily a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, but everyday people in our lives that may say something to us or do say things to us that inspire us or connect with us in a way that nobody truly understands. And so think through that. We have to understand there are times when we have nothing in our lives that, but God. Principle number three, God delights in taking our talents, our time, and our material resources and multiplying their effectiveness. There was always just enough oil. There was always just enough flour. God used just enough for sustaining life for Elijah, the lady, and her child. Not in excess, but just enough at the right time. Just like with the ravens in the water, God provided just enough. Circumstances change. God provided just enough through the lady and her flour and her oil and her willingness and her willingness to serve. Are you willing? Are you willing to just let God use you any way possible this guy, this, this lady did not have a relationship with God. She had heard about God because she definitely recognized Elijah from his garb or his accent and said, your God, not mine, but your God, surely knows. But she was, she was a willing vessel just to be used. And God used her just enough at just the right time every day. Are you willing to be that person? Are you willing to allow God to use you in ways that you don't understand or you can't see the final outcome? Are you willing to take that step of faith to help that person to, to do what God has called you to do over here, start a ministry to uh, minister to people that nobody else wants to minister to, to come up with a way to, to love people? There's a lady in our community um, who I've gotten to know over the last few years and especially in the last 18 months or so with her heart and passion for the hungry, for the poor. And so we now have in our community a soup kitchen that people can get a meal um, twice a week, home-cooked meal at supper um, for our community. It hasn't been easy for her. She's had limited resources. She's had a hard time getting people in our community and organizations and even churches in our community to help support her and her ministry. And it's an incredible ministry. As my wife and I served there uh, a few weeks ago, just to see how many people came in, see the spirit in which she interacted with each person and made them feel valuable, 
made them feel valued and cared for. She just wants to provide a need and, a, and provide through ministry. Um, and to see all the people in the kitchen working to cook, they stuck me at the dishwasher about my gift to be able to um, do dishes. <laughs> so they let me do dishes. And I think it was cool. I love spraying people with water every once in a while and, and making things clean and ready for somebody else to use. That's okay. Um, so we all had our role. Um, they didn't let me cook. They kept me all the way away from the food, but they let me clean up their mess, and I loved it. Um, and so are you willing to take that step? And make, It's an effort. It's hard sometimes to take that extra step to go the extra mile to help fulfill a vision and a passion in your life that God has put there to help and serve people. What is God calling you to do? What is God calling me to do? How are we to minister more effectively in the community in which we're planted? Uh, I sent a text uh, this morning uh, before the taping of this uh, Bible study to a friend of mine who, who travels on occasion. I just said, praying for you as you travel, for wisdom, for safety, and for the opportunity to minister to someone. And so that should be our goal each and every day is to use the, the materials and the resources and allow God to multiply them because we don't know how we're going to be able to do that. Another way is you hear a message on the radio. I get a phone call from a, another person in our church. Hey, I heard this on the radio. Someone needs help. I think we can do it. And I said, great, let's figure it out. So now we send somebody over to this person's house once a week to help them with a couple things around their house. A, uh, an elderly man who um, has had a couple strokes and is real limited in what he's able to do. However, we can help him with a couple tasks that he asks, that he feels need. Um, so what are you willing to do? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone and allow God to multiply anything that you have to more effectively reach who God wants reached? Principle number four. At times the Lord keeps us on the edge of uncertainty to develop our faith in Him. Whew, that is not fun. Have you ever stood there and said, God, what? What, what, what? What's next? What am I to do? You've brought me to here, but I don't see, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see any hope. I don't see even the purpose for me being here. You know, what if Elijah was sent to an oasis full of food and water? What he had depended on God, he thought, man, I've got the high life. I can hang out here all the time. And I believe he would have gotten sidetracked from his mission and his purpose. He would have gotten sidetracked in a way that he may have still been doing something like God wanted him to do, but he wouldn't have been as focused and he wouldn't have been as dependent. He might have even, excuse me, forgotten about God. You know, when things are good, we tend to have more faith in ourselves than in God. You see, God uses uncertainty many times in our life to grow our faith and cause us to depend on more and more on Him. The uncertainty of walking away from a job that you were passionate about, but you felt like your time there had ended, but you had no place to go. What do you do? You need to provide for your family, but at the same time, you know God's telling you to walk away. What do you do? Do you believe that God will provide? in times of uncertainty or in the uncertain times of being without work and hoping for a job and needing a job to help provide for your family but also for your self-worth when we when we don't we don't feel like we're making a contribution some of us feel like i gotta do something or i'm gonna go insane you see god uses those times of uncertainty to grow our faith have you ever noticed that in those times of uncertainty, we're doing one of two things. We're either more connected to God during that time, seeking God and desiring God, or where do you want me to go next, or do next, or say, or be, or, or cursing God. So two ways we're, we're connected to God. We're just doing it differently. Um, but a lot of times that frustration, anger towards God, if we're honest and open, we'll turn around and God will use it. Just like when we openly seek and, and passionately pursue Him because God does use these times of uncertainty to grow our faith. 
and cause us to depend, depend more and more on Him. You see, we, you and I, at least I do, we tend to like, I want to have a clear grasp on every situation that I face. I want to know the ins and outs. I want to know all the details. I want to know what I'm getting into before I get into it. I don't like, now, to be honest with you, I do like a little chaos. I like a little bit of chaos that says, I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the details, but let's just figure it out as we go. But yet, usually when I do that, I have a good idea where I'm headed. And I feel like God has equipped me to be able to handle a lot of situations. But whoo, when they're not that way and I have to totally depend on God, it is difficult. But oh, so rewarding on the other side. And a lot of times an uncertain future leaves us feeling insecure and vulnerable. When we're not in control, when we don't have all the answers, when um, we don't know what the outcomes will be. It's hard, and so we, we resort to insecurity and vulnerability, and those, those are things that God has not given us. God has not given us a, a fear or insecurity. God is secure. When we have a relation with Christ, we are secure. We have no fear. Those are, we are not timid. We are bold. When we trust God, He can use uncertain circumstances of our lives to prepare us for great works of faith. We read that again. When we trust God, we trust God He can use these uncertain circumstances in our lives to prepare us for great works of faith. So are you ready to take that step? Are you ready to, to move past the sitting in the chair and studying about God's Word and studying about what God wants us to do and take that step of faith and do what God's Word says? A lot of times we get so connected and so focused on studying God's Word that we don't put God's Word into action. And if you look through the life of Elijah or, or Joseph or Moses or Aaron or, or um, Joshua or David or even Solomon in his early years and all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Job, um, Jonah, and you go into the New Testament and the disciples and Paul and all those, they didn't just read about God's Word. And they lived it because God's Word is not a history book, yet it is. It's an action book. It propels us into the into day-to-day -day living. And so are you willing to take that step to put God's Word in action? God, we thank you for today and this opportunity that we've had to join our hearts together to, to study your Word, to uh, be challenged by the, the prophet Elijah, how he was bold how he focused on God, but also to be inspired by a lady who had no idea she was a part of a bigger story. To be, to be inspired and challenged by a lady who took that step of faith without even knowing who God really was and not having a relationship, but trusted this man and the words that he spoke. She took action. Elijah took action. They did not settle for just saying, okay, God, here I am. I know who you are. I studied your words. So take care of me. They were active. Elijah didn't stay still. He went forward. The lady went back and made something for a stranger first. And they depended on God every day. And can we do that? Can we depend on God to the point that we will trust him with our next bite of food, our next drink of water, the next action we're to take, the next person we meet, is a divine appointment. So God, help us to see the world that way, to see our lives that way, that we are to be people of action and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining in with this half hour as we have studied God's Word and explored God's Word and I've been challenged by God's Word. And so um, we'll continue on next in the next session with another step in the life of Elijah. Um, and I'm just going to give you a moment to respond. If you would like to um, contact me or any one of our pastors on staff, Pete, please feel free to contact us at the church office, 270-465-8115. Or you can 
Look us up online at camelsvillebaptistchurch.com and you can email us through the staff page or through the contact page. We'd love to hear from you. May God continue to bless you each and every day.